On the 18th of July, 2013, Ellen left for the airport to fly to Minneapolis. Then, on the 28th, I left on the motorcycle, also headed for Minneapolis. My plan was Wells, Nevada, Cheyenne, Wyoming, Omaha, Nebraska, and then on to Minneapolis. By the time I got to Wells, I had been sprinkled on twice, which was cooling and felt good. That night, the sky was very threatening. The next morning, the sunrise was spectacular. Typical desert weather. The threat continued well into Wyoming. The next day, I got a good example of what southern Wyoming and Nebraska are like. Very windy and very flat. I stopped at a restaurant and couldn't resist taking this picture. City dog, country dog, and boondoggle. Great sense of humor, those corn huskers. When I arrived on Wednesday the 31st, I got off the freeway and was immediately lost. A cop came along and saw me with the tail open on the motorcycle and asked where I was going. I told him what the address was and he looked it up on his GPS. He told me exactly how to get there. I was so impressed with his friendliness. A very good feeling for that town. The next day, Ellen and I took off for a little sightseeing ride on the bike. We had lunch on the banks of an inner city lake and then continued to the burned out remnants of the General Mills plant. Accord according to this, in 1945, Betty Crocker was the second best known woman in America, right behind Eleanor Roosevelt. This building is now being used for social events such as weddings, birthday parties, and historical tours. Sitting right on the banks of the Mississippi with a broad territorial view, a docent was able to give us an enlightening history of this piece of Americana. They have resurrected some old footage and images of how this plant looked in its heyday. We were told the typical work period was six days a week, 12 hours a day. Work at times, but that's okay. We had a bunch of girls work up there until these fellows came back out of service and took our jobs away from us. James Hill built this stone arch bridge for his Great Northern Railway. Today it's used as a pedestrian and bicycle bridge. The bridge was altered somewhat from its original appearance when the lock and dam was built at St. Anthony's Falls. Two of the arches were replaced with a truss so barges could pass through the locks. Later in 1965, Floodwaters undermined three of the piers and caused the bridge to sag. The bridge was repaired by strengthening the piers and reinforcing underneath two of the arches. The 
Ford Dam, officially known as Lock and Dam Number no. 1, was built in 1917 just north of the confluence of the Mississippi River and the Minnesota River. This dam was previously owned by Ford Motor Company, which operated a hydroelectric power station to feed electricity to its Twin Cities assembly plant. The next day, Colleen was gracious enough to drive us around the Twin Cities in her car. We began with Minnehaha Park, which overlooks the Mississippi River and is one of Minneapolis' oldest and most popular parks, attracting over 850,000 visitors annually. It's a popular site for weddings, concerts, picnics, and viewing the autumn leaves. Within this park is Longfellow Gardens, which is a formal garden containing a pergola, native shrubs, flowers, grasses, and stunning views of downtown Minneapolis. Also within this park is Hiawatha Falls, a 53-foot falls on the Minnehaha Creek. Next, we visited the downtown area, which included, among other things, the state capitol and the Cathedral of St. Paul, as well as the Alexander Theater, the home of Garrison Keeler and the Prairie Home Companion. The next day we packed up the bike and headed west from Minneapolis with our first stop as Granite Falls, Minnesota on the Minnesota River. Very cute little town. Pipestone National Monument is one of the few remaining areas of native tall grass prairie. Over 400,000 square miles of tall grass prairie once covered the Midwest. Now, less than 1% of the original tall grass prairie remains. For countless generations, American Indians have quarried the red pipestone found at this site. These grounds are sacred to many people because the pipestone quarried here is carved into pipes used for prayer. Many believe that the pipe's smoke carries one's prayer to the Great Spirit. The traditions of quarrying and pipe making continue here today. Whenever I'm in the Midwest, I always find certain signs which tell me that I'm definitely in the Midwest. One of those signs is a long freight train. I realize this is not a freight train and it's a tanker train, but it nevertheless is a great long train. And to me that symbolizes the American commerce and how we do things here. Our next stop was at the end of the day, and it was Sioux Falls, South Dakota. We really didn't know what to expect, and we were very, very pleasantly surprised by this town. In fact, a waiter in the restaurant was a recent transplant from San Francisco, and very sophisticated. Sioux Falls is the 43rd fastest growing city in the United States. Currently, it has around 230,000 population. There are 26 pieces of art in a four block area where the restaurants and the downtown area is. This town is culturally very awake. The next day after leaving Sioux Falls we headed for Mitchell which has the Corn Palace. That's a very interesting thing to see. It's very creative, actually. There are tons of different colors of 
corn cobs and they're all stapled on a background and they make all sorts of different images. It's kind of a fun thing to go through. Great deal of local pride. I find grain elevators are like the long freight trains, icons of the Midwest and how we process and raise our food and store it. By the end of this day, we were in Pierre, South Dakota, and had met up with the rest of our group who had come all the way down from Vermont. Now we were all together. South Dakota was a small, starving prairie town with 326 people and Ted Houston bought the pharmacy and turned it around. It's quite a success story. Mount Rushmore had just been finished and traffic was picking up so they decided to put a sign on the highway free ice water. That was the beginning of the turnaround. South Dakota is famous for its dinosaurs, with nearly all major groups represented in this state. When the Lakota Indians first encountered the striking moon-like landscape, they aptly called the area Mako Siko, or Badland. They call it the Wall. It extends for a hundred miles through the dry plains of South Dakota, a huge natural barrier. Those who pass through the upper prairie a few miles north might not even know it exists. Those who traverse the lower prairie to the south, however, can't miss it. By the time we got to Rapid City and found our hotel, we were worn out and we were glad to be off the bikes. The next day, we took off to explore the Black Hills and Mount Rushmore and all that area has to offer. The Black Hills is a translation of the Lakota the hills were so called because of their dark appearance. From a distance, they were covered in trees. The first motorcycle rally was held in 1938 and the 65th in 2005, which saw more than 550,000 riders. This rally is a large part of the regional economy. Harney Peak which rises to 7,244 feet, is the highest point east of the Rockies and is in the Black Hills. Most motorcycle riders come here because of the awe-inspiring scenery. The 
next day, Alan and I rode down Spearfish Canyon and explored that part of the Black Hills. Spearfish Creek is especially interesting because in the winter it freezes from the bottom up and the top continues to move so fishing is always available. Without helmets, do-rags are the fashion statement of the hour. That night, we got a good taste of a Black Hills thunderstorm. This was the last lodging available outside of Red Lodge as we headed up to Beartooth. Great rooms and a wonderful restaurant. It was a great place to stay. This is the view out of our room and this wonderful sound serenaded us all night long. The Beartooth range got its name from a distinctly shaped mountain peak that resembles a bear's tooth and makes up the eastern portion of the Absaroka Beartooth Wilderness. These two ranges differ greatly with the young jagged Absarokas having been formed by recent volcanic activity and the Precambrian granite plateaus of the Beartooths having been uplifted and subsequently weathered by glacial activity in the region. Wow, we rode up that? The Beartooth Highway runs from Red Lodge, Montana to Cook City, Montana to the eastern entrance of the Yellowstone Park and has been described by Charles Corralt as the most beautiful highway in America. <laughs> the Beartooths are made up almost entirely of granite rock. The highest peak in the range is located in Wyoming is Francis Peak at 13,153. The Beartooths are more alpine with huge treeless plateaus and the highest peak in the state of Montana. This wilderness area has 30 peaks over 12,000 feet and has a large number of small glaciers. Yellowstone National Park was established by Congress and signed into law by President Ulysses S. Grant in March of 1872. As we continued into the park, we were quite fortunate as sun was just setting when we found our hotel and cabins that we would stay in for the night. Yellowstone Lake is the largest body of water in Yellowstone National Park. The lake is 7,732 feet above sea level and covers 136 square miles. The average lake depth is 139 feet and its deepest spot is at least 390 feet. Yellowstone Lake is the largest freshwater lake above 7,000 feet in North America. The next morning we rode into the park and prepared for the eruption of Old Faithful.
The Yellowstone caldera is the largest supervolcano on the continent and is still considered an active volcano. It has erupted with tremendous force several times in the last two million years. Old Faithful erupts more frequently than any of the big volcanoes in the park, although it's not the largest or most regular geyser in the park. The intervals between eruptions is about 93 minutes, varying from 50 to 127 minutes. An eruption lasts one and a half to five minutes and expels 3,700 to 8,400 gallons of boiling water reaching a height of 106 to 184 feet. In anticipation of the volcano erupting, we walked to the back side of the geyser and got better position for photographs. After the eruption was over, Alan and I took off on a little walk crossing over the Firehole River and up a footpath. Blue Star Spring. There's one that is very famous. It's called the As we continued out of the park toward the Tetons, we crossed the Lewis River, which was a very spectacular little stop with the Lewis Falls right there. The next stop was for a fantastic photo opportunity of the Tetons, all while nightfall was upon us and the sky was changing quickly. In 1987, the National Museum of Wildlife Art was founded and subsequently opened in September of 1994. Currently, it features the JKM collection, the Carl Rungius collection, and the latest, the Sculpture Trail. This building makes use of Idaho quartzite and its structure and it overlooks the National Elk Refuge. After we completed the museum, we found our way to the Teton Village where we took the tram to the very top of the mountain and we could look down at the entire village of Jackson and the Snake River. That furthest peak in the far ground is the Grand Teton Peak, elevation 13,770 feet.
The next day, we all headed home. The Vermont Riders headed east, Alan and I headed west. Our first stop was Jackpot, Nevada, right on the border, and then Reno, and then on home. A really wonderful ride.